I have not been here for quite some time. And when I arrived yesterday, I was amazed to see how much development has taken place during that short period of time. Malaysia and Brunei has always been close together. In the days before we had Malaysia, in the days when there were the Malay states in the peninsula, Brunei was already a close friend. Of course, after we became a federation, we continued to have good relations with Brunei. And eventually, we became members of the ASEAN group of countries in Southeast Asia. Now, relationship between nations are very important. Sometimes there will be conflict, sometimes there will be good relations. But whether there is conflict or not, nations should try and avoid confrontations and conflicts uh, resulting in wars. The relationship with Brunei has been something that we have fostered together. It's not only on the part of Brunei, but also on the part of Malaysia. There is a desire to be close together, to be friends, and to help each other. This, of course, is partly because we are people of the same race, and we have the same language, and also the same culture, and uh, we are largely Islamic states. The language may differ somewhat when spoken locally. I come from the state of Kadah, and the Kadah dialect is not understood by the Slango dialect, and also by the Pichuho people. So when I married somebody from Slango, we had to adjust to each other. <laughs> we both speak Malay, but different kinds of Malay. The Kadah Malay is a little bit rough, but Slango Malay is much more like standard Malay, but that did not uh, get in the way of our uh, being married. <laughs> so it would, should be the same with countries like Malaysia and Brunei. I'm quite sure in Brunei you have certain words where we don't understand, and we have certain words that you don't understand, but largely we speak the same language. And of course, when we speak little, literal Malay, uh, the common Malay that we now use, the language is, uh, well, it's the same. So that brings us close together. That we are largely Muslims is also another factor. And our culture too resembles each other very much. This morning I had breakfast with His Majesty. And the food served was like the food served in Malaysia except thing that uh, they miniaturize it. <laughs> what used to be big, big uh, kui, kui in Malaysia becomes a very tiny one. <laughs> but I, I'm not unfamiliar with them. So there are so many factors why we should be close to each other because of so many similarities between us. So all along, Malaysia and Brunei has kept a good relations. There will be, there may have been some little differences, but they don't last for very long. Very quickly, we forget about the past and we look into the future, a future in which Malaysia, Malaysia and Brunei will work together. Then there is the ASEAN grouping. Today, ASEAN has got 10 members, but originally there were only five until Brunei joined, and then later on all the other countries of Southeast Asia joined to form this uh, entity, this uh, regional organization called ASEAN. Within ASEAN, the fact is that the Malay-speaking people dominated. We speak the same language in Malaysia, of course, in Indonesia and in Brunei. These three countries added together make up about almost half the population of Southeast Asia. 
we should actually be doing very well because a big population, even if the people are quite poor, but the numbers contribute towards making a big nation or a big population a good market. Now, market drives trade, and trade, of course, increases wealth. We should be trading with each other without any hindrance. But, of course, we have some problems about borders and the, th and the like, and these uh, come in the way of much closer trade relations between countries. But between Brunei and Malaysia, there is less uh, separation. Uh, in fact, uh, the eastern part of Malaysia, constituting of uh, Sabah and Sarawak, is very close to Brunei. And I think at this moment, uh, the benefit, of course, goes to Sabah and Sarawak because the ringgit is only one-third the, the value of the Brunei dollar, which means that our products are one-third as cheap as in Brunei. Of course, the products are uh, goods in the peninsula of Malaysia are also much cheaper than in Brunei, which uh, cause a lot of uh, tourists to come to Malaysia to spend their money, uh, which is which will buy more things in Malaysia than in Brunei itself. But at one time, of course, one Brunei dollar is the same as one ringgit, but uh, somehow or other the ringgit has depreciated. Today it is four ringgit to one US dollar. I don't know why it happens, but you know the market determines the value of the ringgit. If I had my way, I would determine the value of the ringgit as I did in 97. But now uh, I have lost control <laughs> and maybe after coming back to, I wouldn't regain that kind of control that I had before. But uh, as far as Brunei is concerned, the policy of this new government of Malaysia will be the same, that we want to continue to be friends of Brunei to be work together with Brunei. We would like to be participating in any uh, development that is happening in Brunei. And we know that this university itself has had uh, vice chancellors, I think, from, from Malaysia. So the closeness is there. It is up to us to find ways and means for us to work with each other to our mutual benefit. That is what we look forward to. And this new government of Malaysia will do its, um, its utmost in order to strengthen that relationship. Uh, well, relationship between countries will be enhanced by the uh, friendship between the leaders. Uh, I would like to claim that I know his Highness, His Royal Highness, His Majesty the Sultan, uh, quite well, even so far as to claim to be a friend of his. So we, when we meet and talk, we speak the same language and we understand each other. And that facilitates uh, the relationship, the strengthening of relationship between Malaysia and Brunei. I look forward to working closely with Brunei. During the short term, I'm going to be Prime Minister of Malaysia, and I am quite sure working together would be productive for both Brunei and for Malaysia, and would enhance the role of Brunei and Malaysia in the ASEAN group of countries. I hope that this will see a very fruitful future for this country because the international scene is changing very fast and we need to understand what is happening in the rest of the world and we have a need to adjust to these new changes that are taking place in the world and in this part of the world. Thank you. My question is, as at the whole, at the national level, how do you go about in making decisions on these priorities? How do you go about in allocating resources such as human resources, uh, investments, education, for example? How do you coordinate it all? How do you prioritize 
to achieve the common goal of wealth generation, for example. Thank you. How do you prioritize? Well, the first thing is to ask yourself, how much money do you have? <laughs> you know, we would like to build great things in our countries. But if you don't have the money, you may end up being indebted to other people. And borrowing money is not a good thing for any government. You can borrow, but borrow just enough so that you can repay from the investment that you make. That is the first thing that you should consider. Then, of course, you have to know the needs of the country. What is it that you need? You need roads, you need water supply, you need electricity. All these infrastructures are important for all countries. But there are some which will, will be more needed than another. For Malaysia, of course, roads are very important because we are a peninsula that is very long and we need to communicate with each other, so we need roads. So the first thing that we did was to, to build a north-south highway. And when you build a north-south highway, you build a highway anyway. Development takes place along the way. Then, of course, we need to have water because people want to have good, clean water to drink. So that, too, will be attended uh, almost simultaneously with the highway. And then, of course, there is a need for electricity. Later on, if you need, you may want to do uh, a train, uh, have a railway line, ports, airports, and all that. This come a little bit later. But nevertheless, they are essential. They can begin small, but they can grow over time. So that's how uh, we make a choice. We make a decision as to what do we need first that we can invest with the money that we have. We can borrow, but don't borrow too much. Thank you. My question is about strategic leadership. Have you found perhaps maybe that your strategic narrative has changed a lot or deferred a lot from the last time you were the prime minister and now that you're a prime minister, albeit as you've alluded to temporarily? And has that actually won the hearts of perhaps the Electoral College in Malaysia, you think, uh, anticipate in the near future? Thank you. Well, a leader must think about solving the problem of the country. Uh, he has to, well, decide on what plans to use, what strategy to adhere to. But one of the most important things, of course, is to get things going. When I became Prime Minister in 1981, everything was in place. The machinery of government was working fine. All I need to do is to decide on what to do with, what to do with the machinery and the money that we had. So things went on very smoothly. This time, it is totally different. We are actually very nearly bankrupt because of the amount of money that we borrowed. And secondly, the machinery of government has been spoiled. It has been turned not into a machinery for the governance of the country. It was turned into a machinery for supporting the previous government in order to win elections. So now we find that first, we have to attend to our borrowings, our the loans that we have. As you know, if you don't pay your interest, you can be uh, declared bankrupt. So we have to find the money to pay interest and also the principal later on. That is a tough thing because assets have got to be sold in order to get the money because we are not collecting enough taxes in order to service the loans even. And the new ventures that we went into, or rather the previous government went into, could not yield enough profit to service the loans. That is a big problem for us. Uh, then we have to work with the machinery of the government, which has been spoiled. We need to remove people, appoint new people, restructure the government. So this is taking us a lot of, uh, lo costing us a lot of time and money. So we are now unable to do the kind of things that we did before 
to grow the country, to develop the country. Now it is to correct the mistakes of the past. But uh, that is a straightforward uh, uh, strategy, Not nothing very complicated about it. But soon we will have to meet the people's expectations. They want the country to begin to develop again. And for that, uh, we still have to depend upon foreign direct investment, local uh, domestic investment, and the management of the finances of the country. We can do that, we have some experience, and I think uh, given a little time, we may be able to recover. Um, there, are, there are more females than males in higher institutions worldwide. Uh, my question is, is this happening in Malaysia, and if so, what is the impact to the Malaysian economy? Thank you, Tom. I'm afraid uh, we have the same problem. <laughs> in the universities, more than 60% of the students would be female, would be girls. Uh, unfortunately, in my time, it was not so. <laughs> in my time, the only uh, girl there was so happened to be my wife now. <laughs> but now the boys have a lot of choice. <laughs> but why is, is it so? Why, why is it that there are not enough um, boys to, to study? Somehow or rather, they are not motivated. Uh, they are play, play, playful. They don't want to be serious about their future. I believe that this has something to do with upbringing. Because the upbringing of a child is very important in order to point him in the right direction. When you have a society in which both father and mother now work, they don't have enough time for their children. They don't spend quality time with their children to, I to uh, implant in them the values that will make them good character in the future. But somehow or other, the girls seem to absorb uh, good values, and uh, they are doing very well. Now we are seeing more girls heading, more women heading ministries than ever before. And of course, they have also invaded the cabinet, my cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> but they are contributing. So the boys had better buck up, you <laughs> see. Of course, now we cannot cane them. <laughs> that is not allowed. But I think uh, one of the things that we need to do, and we have decided to do this in Malaysia, is that to implant good values in our little children when they were still in the kindergarten. That is the time when they are impressionable. If you wait until later, they have hardened, they have learned all the bad things from their friends, then it's be, it will be very difficult to shape them. But if we start in the kindergarten and we implant in them good values about hard work, about being uh, diligent, about uh, being trustworthy and all that, then they will grow up, I think, to be more serious about their future and perhaps they will go to the university. So Malaysia, as other country of ASEAN actually, has already embarked in the what we call the energy transition period. So what would be the uh, approach of your cabinet uh, regarding this energy transition, and what would be, according to you, the major uh, measure to, to take, uh, maybe nationally or at the ASEAN level, uh, to achieve it? Before we, we just decide that we need water, we build a dam, and we get the supply of water. The same thing with electricity. If you have water-based uh <coughs> electricity, then you will just do the same thing. But today we have to consider the environment. We cannot just place our dams anywhere we like. We have to think of the animals living in the forest. We cannot cut down the trees and all that. So that limits our choice. We have to be b more careful about how we dam up rivers and also generate electricity. If you use too much uh, uh, f fuel, oil, petroleum, and all that. You are going to cause a lot of uh, uh, pollution. But on the other hand, whatever you use in order to generate power uh, can be uh, reduced in terms of 
uh, of pollution. And the power can then be used by other, uh, by motor vehicles, for example, uh, where electric driven cars would emit less uh, uh, noxious gases. So all these factors have got to be taken into consideration now. Uh, I believe that Malaysia still has good potential for power generation, um, but it, it will not be much from uh, the uh, <coughs> hydro pow power because we don't have big rivers. Uh, we will have to use cleaner material, uh, and we are also resorting to solar, uh, solar panels. But solar panels require huge areas, so that is a limitation. So in order to provide for the needs of the country, uh, which, which, which will grow all the time, we need to be very careful about how we generate power and how we collect water. Uh, Malaysia is blessed with a lot of rain, but a lot of rain doesn't mean that you can get water. It is how you catch the, r the rain water. Perhaps all roofs in the future will have to be catchment areas uh, so that uh, the rainwater is not wasted. Uh, today, Malaysia is not short of electricity, not short of water, but in the future, there will be a problem, especially for the islands. Uh, Langkawi Island has been developed as a tourist uh, destination, but Langkawi has not enough water. Water has got to be uh, piped from the mainland. And now we are again re reaching the limit. Uh, we need to put in more pipes. But fortunately, uh, there is enough water from the mainland to be piped into Langkawi. So in future, all islands will face this problem. But there are now new ways of generating electricity and new ways of uh, deep water wells, for example which will provide water even for isolated islands. So all these points have got to be taken into consideration. And uh, we in future think that we may have to generate electricity from Sumatra. Uh, already we are selling electricity to Singapore and uh, many ASEAN countries are buying electricity from countries like Laos, which has uh, good power power supply, water supply. So th these are the many things that has been taken into consideration. Since uh, Brunei is close to uh, Sabah and Sarawak and Sabah, and Sarawak has got hu huge uh, hydro potential. So maybe I at a stage later, Brunei might be able to source uh, electricity from Sarawak. But I noticed that Although Brunei is small, its rivers are big. So maybe from some point or other, we may be able to generate hydroelectric power in Brunei itself. Thank you. Um, my question to Yang Ahmad Berhor Maktun, um, what would your advice to the young generation, especially uh, with the current challenges, as you mentioned, uh, more motivation are needed, and also the upbringing values and characters, as uh, you find your motivation and your driven factors in facing the current challenges? I was very fortunate because when I was young, there were no uh, TV, no telephone to distract me, no computers to distract me. But today's youth are distracted by the availability of all kinds of entertainment. They like to be entertained. And when they use a computer, it's not because they want to learn something, but rather it is because they can play games and uh, they can, uh, well, access news which are not really very useful. Uh, the problem that I see among the youth is that uh, this distraction is bad for them. We need to have some control, but of course we now appreciate freedom very much. We don't try to control anything. We cannot cane children, for example. When I was small, I was caned by my master. But now, of course, you do that, the parents will come for you. So we need to have some distraction for the children so that they, they are distracted with good things rather than bad things. 
there are ways of entertaining them at the same time teaching them. Uh, so we are at the moment in Malaysia trying to, to produce books uh, using uh, IT in order that uh, they will see cartoons and the cartoons will tell them what they need to know. Uh, that means they are being entertained and getting knowledge at the same time. In future, I think the, the internet will be the source of uh, knowledge for most people. And it, it will be very comprehensive. Almost about everything that you want to know now can be accessed through the internet. So the young people should be entertained, but should also find things that are both entertaining and also <coughs> uh, would give them some, uh, some new knowledge that they will need. Uh, the future is in IT because this is the most powerful uh, set of technology that we have ever found. With this technology, you can control about everything. Now you don't have to have wires to reach the object you want to control. Through RFID and the rest, you can control. Now this remote control is so powerful that you can actually uh, control a drone seven miles away from you. So these are things that we must acquire because the drone is both um, an entertainment, you can play with it, but also you can learn a lot of things from it. Thank you. So my question is related to the fourth industrial revolution and skills you view as important for youth to master and excel. Yeah, we are in the fourth industrial revolution. We talk about 4.0 and uh, I'm afraid that uh, I am past that already. We know that uh, what caused the new industrial re revolution is the new knowledge, particularly the discovery of uh, microchips. With the microchip, you can do almost anything that you like. You can control satellite way out in outer space. You can also control drones and, car and uh, cars and all that, so that you can have driverless cars. All these things have become possible because of new technology. One is the capacity of the microchip. The other one is the sensors. The sensors that somehow or other can tell you exactly where you are. And also, if a car comes near you, the car will sense the, the next car, which is too close, or somebody wants to approach the car. Already the car will scream. That, that is the level of uh, science that we have reached today. I had not never thought that it could be possible. For example, your handphone. Your handphone is both a broadcasting station as well as a receiving station, but it can do mo much more than the old radios or TV station, the big houses with all the um, uh, complex machinery, and uh, circuits and all that. Now, in your, p in your pocket, you carry a broadcasting station, a whole broadcasting station, and you can talk to somebody in New York at the same time without any relay, without having to call an operator. So we, every one of us, have become very powerful. But the thing is, how do we make e full use of the, this power that we have? You hear people coming up with um, Google and, uh, and the other systems, uh, Facebook, etc. These people understand the power and how to make use of the power to improve your, your way of life. Uh, this man in China, for example, uh, Alibaba, his, his name is not, uh, that's the company's name. He is Jack. Jack <laughs> Jack Ma, I met him recently. He's a fantastic man. He can see what you can use, how you can use this power in order to enrich everybody. Today, you may, uh, in the past, of course, when somebody in the village, 
produces some small uh, product uh, like uh, from bamboo or even uh, cook uh, a cake in the the market is confined to that village at the most he can reach the next town but today your market is actually the whole world because when you go online you can market your product throughout the world and you don't have to spend so much money on advertising and middlemen. So it is the idea that you have that can empower the big, the power that is given to all of us. So young people must are more able to think of new things. Old people are resistant. That is why you find old people not able to cope with the c their computer. Whereas the young people are forever fiddling with their telephones and doing all kinds of things. Sometimes not so good. <laughs> okay? So the young people have a great future for them because they understand there is no limit. The old people think there is a limit. When I first um, bought a tape recorder, I understand that the tape recorder is like a gramophone except thing that you record the sound on the tape. And later on, they gave me a tape a recorder that is very small. And they said, this can record. There is no tape there, nothing at all. There is some microchips there, hearing what you say, recording it, and speaking back to you. It is much more powerful than the old tape recorder. For me, it is almost difficult to think that this small thing can replace that big tape recorder. But in the future, you, the young people will find that this small thing, which they have accepted, can do wonders, will do more wonders for them. So the thing to do for the young people is to understand IT, understand electronics, understand the power of the microchip, which today controls almost everything that we do. And one of the things that uh, perhaps is, is uh, something that we are looking into the future is uh, Chinese currency uh, becoming more important than US dollar. Uh, China is very active in uh, bilateral and multilateral negotiations on using uh, Chinese yuan as a, a trade transaction, trade currency. Um, ASEAN as a, as a group is a major trading partner. I would like to know your views about uh, both in terms of ASEAN and specifically Malaysia if you think that Chinese currency will take over US dollar in the next five to ten years. Thank you. <coughs> Why do you use the US dollar? That is because at Bretton Woods they decided that the US dollar, dollar is the standard. One US dollar, one thirty-six, uh, uh, one US dollar is thirty-six, uh, no, one ounce of gold is 36 US dollar. They fixed that at that time, and that was the gold standard. For a time, of course, when we buy and sell things, we are actually thinking in terms of gold. Each US dollar is one over 36 uh, ounce of gold. And then, of course, they decided to go off the gold standard. But they still maintain the fiction that it, it has the same value. It doesn't. Now, one ounce of gold is about 1,200 US dollar. That's how much the US dollar has depreciated. But we have been brought up to think of the US dollar as the standard. Why should the US dollar be a standard? Other, other currencies, too, can be the standard. But uh, the US will feel very unhappy if you drop the dollar as the standard uh, for currencies. Uh, if you, s you don't use the U.S. dollar, the U.S. will go bankrupt immediately because it owes the world $14 trillion, which it cannot pay. It doesn't have that much gold to pay. So if you switch from U.S. to y the Chinese currency, uh, the U.S. is going to feel very unhappy. And I think some people had ideas about that, and they have been taught not to have such ideas. <laughs> mm -hmm. But as you know, I suggested at one time, we should have an East Asian currency. 
uh, and we should have a, a different way of trading, more like butter trading than uh, the current way of, uh, of trading. Uh, butter trading, not in the sense that you change goods for goods, but you change value for value. If your import is 100 million, your export is 90 million, then to that particular country, then you, ha you have to export 10, billion mo 10 million more before you can achieve a, a, well, a full payment from both sides. That is one way of doing things, but uh, uh, somehow that idea was not uh, approved by certain authorities. So now we have the Chinese coming out and China is going to be very, very rich. I know them. I know the people in Malaysia also. We have 26% Chinese people and they are very, very diligent, very dynamic. They can build, uh, build any, any country very, very quickly as they have built China. So imagine 1.4 billion Chinese, very productive, becoming very, very rich. Why should they use the US dollar? I mean, they are the people with the money, with the property, with the wealth. So one day they may decide that if you want to buy, you have to use the Chinese currency and you will have no choice. You will have to use Chinese currency. I don't know how long we can resist, but it will come one day. Actually, what are the crucial initiatives that Malaysia has uh, been putting effort in improving the current education system in Malaysia that maybe Brunei can follow, inshallah? Education is, of course, very important. Before, just the ability to read and write constitutes education. So people are taught how to read and to write. But the contents was not very, uh, not really contributing to the uh, career of the person who has acquired this knowledge. In fact, uh, in the past, I rem remember that for the civil service, they always accept BAs and MAs. Although what they had to do had nothing to do with those uh, subjects, those uh, art subjects that they learn. They need to learn about administration, about management. But now we are more practical. We plan education to suit the career that the person will follow or to suit the ambition of the country to make uh, progress in certain areas. Today, I think most people want to study engineering, engineering science and the various branches of engineering. In particular today, it is all about IT, about, uh, uh, about uh, engineering and uh, electronics, etc. So when you have a, a, an education program, you need to think about the future of the people you are educating not just to teach him read, to read and write, but what will he do after he has graduated? And that means that you have to know the market. What is the market looking for? What kind of people? If you know what the market is looking for, then you can design the education program to suit the needs of the market. And today, I believe in most uh, countries, the concentration is on engineering and technology because these are the people who are easily employable. Education just for the sake of acquiring knowledge is no longer relevant today. Education must be related to the, pro pro uh, to the ambition or to the planning of the country for its future. Then only they will be employable. Thank you.